Hello everyone, this is Jen and I make useful English Lit Study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices and more to help you get top grades in the subject. Some of you have asked me for more content on Romeo and Juliet and I recently received a request to do a quick analysis on the Queen Maud speech in Act 1, Scene 4 of the play. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. This speech is delivered by Romeo's friend Mercutio just before they are about to gatecrash the Capulet's ball where Rosalind, Romeo's crush at the start of the play, will be present. So at this point, Romeo is moody and mopey over his unrequited love for Rosalind who isn't even actually remotely aware of his existence. He can't keep talking about how miserable he is though, about Rosalind's lack of attention towards him, which triggers Mikusho to give a teasing response about the fickleness and randomness of desire. So this response is his famous Queen Marb speech, which seems like a pointless long rant that doesn't really contribute to the overall dramatic action of the play, our first read. But if we dive deeper into its language, structure and form, we'll find that it carries interesting and even some surprise surprising significance for our understanding of the play and its performance. So let's dive straight into it. Now the first question that often comes to mind when it comes to the Queen Marb speech is, who is Queen Marb? Supposedly Queen Marb is this apocryphal fairy figure from English folklore who is known to play pranks on men and women by planting dreams and desires in their minds while they are asleep. But Queen Marb's identity actually isn't all that important for our interpretation of the speech. Instead, it's the ideas that this elusive figure embodies. Fantasy, levity, playfulness and mischief set against the weightier themes of the play, like passion, revenge, fouls and death, that really gives Mercutio's speech its key dramatic action at the start of the play. Because remember, we are already told in the prologue that the tragic death of two star-crossed lovers lies in wait. So part of what the Queen Marb reference does is to remind us that no desire or love is ever worth taking too seriously, because much of it is random, fleeting, and products of spontaneous, inexplicable impulses. This moment of comic relief somewhat cushions the blow of the tragic conclusion and tempers the emotional heaviness that will inevitably arrive at the end of the play. By the way guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now in Mercutio's speech, humans, despite our imposing size and presence relative to the minuscule fairy's midwife, who is Queen Marb, are characterized as passive, powerless beings conditioned by all sorts of manipulative puppeteering that they aren't even aware of. So there's a bit of a David versus Goliath trope going on with the characterization of Queen Marb as this tiny, nimble creature whose carriage is made from parts of similarly tiny creatures, as we see in these lines, her wagon spokes made of long spinner's legs, the cover of the wings of grasshoppers, her whip of cricket's bone, her wagoner of small grey coated gnat, etc, etc. This juxtaposition between big and small, visible and invisible, sets up the idea that small elusive forces often combine to shape bigger dreams and desires. It is these hidden forces which often end up controlling our beliefs and consuming our behaviours a lot of which we can't explain with reason or logic. For instance, Queen Marb with a team of little atomies athwart men's noses as they lie asleep, and the soldier who starts and wakes from the drums in his ear being thus frighted can only swear a prayer or two and sleeps again, oblivious to Queen Marb having driveth over his neck and injecting his dream with desires of combat and violence. The anatomical imagery of lovers' brains, courtiers' knees, lawyers' fingers, lady lips, etc. also suggests that despite our having all the faculties for cognitive and physical agency to think and move around, our actual ability to determine our emotions and behaviour is rather limited because our decisions are ultimately shaped by powers beyond our control and comprehension. So upon closer reading then, we'll notice that Mercutio's speech isn't really about love or romantic desire per se, but the fact that humans are enslaved to their desires without ever fully understanding why they harbour such desires, whether these are for love, 
patronage, wealth, status, or glory. So this notion of man being constrained by external forces, whether social or supernatural ones, also relates to the broader theme of fate in the play, which we see as a governing force in the overall dramatic development from the fact that Romeo and Juliet fall in love, but just so happen to come from families that hate each other, to the bungled misunderstandings that will result in each other's deaths at the very end. But here comes what I think would be potentially the most interesting and surprising point to make about this Queen Marv speech. Note the use of enumeration in Mercutio's references to the different personas. Besides lovers, he alludes to characters like courtiers, lawyers, ladies and maids, a parson and a soldier. If you've watched my other videos on Shakespeare's context, you'll know that actors and audiences back in the Elizabethan times were often so close to each other that there'd be moments when meta-theatrical references or lines from plays would almost seem like moments of breaking the fourth wall i.e. when the actors are implicitly addressing the playgoers, giving them this sort of verbal wink, as it were. So Mercutio's cheeky digs at those with power, courtiers, lawyers, and priests, being slaves to their greedy desires, would most likely have invited chortles and cheers from the largely Protestant commoner playgoers at the theatre back in Shakespeare's time. Also, his portrayal of a soldier who dreams of cutting foreign throats and of Spanish blades would have appealed to the crowd's anti-Spanish patrioticism, especially when Romeo and Juliet was written right after the English defeat of the Spanish Armada in 1588. While his bawdy references to maids who lie on their backs becoming women of good carriage, which refers to virgins having sex to bear children, would also have made for a good laugh with the Elizabethan crowd, many of whom would have enjoyed the sort of risque joke that many today would consider misogynistic or demeaning. But of course, we're par for the course back then as a way to lighten up the mood and create some theatrical ambiance. Given these considerations, what seems like a snickering tract about the vagaries of desire and love is also revealed to be a strategic occasion for demagoguery, jingoism, and atmosphere building for Shakespeare, which is perhaps the Bard's way of establishing the trust and bond between the stage and the crowd early on in the performance of the play. So the message from Shakespeare and his playing company is clear. We are skeptics of the powerful and greedy, loyal patriots who wouldn't stand for the sight of the nearest Spaniard, and merry souls who just want to unwind over a lewd joke or two while watching a good show with you. So what's not to like about these actors, or indeed the production? So why don't you stay for the full two or three hours then? And that's it for this video, guys. I hope this quick analysis of the Queen Mark speech gives you some useful, fresh new insights into the speech, which I know can be a bit confusing and weird to unpack. Make sure to check out my other videos on Romeo and Juliet if you study the play. And if you enjoyed this video, I would massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below so that YouTube will know to share this with other passionate, dedicated, top grade English Lit students like yourself. Please subscribe if you haven't already so you never miss a top grade English Lit study video from me. And I will see you in the next one.